Okay, doctor, go ahead. Well, I'm uh, Dr. Gary Lelinsky, Vietnam veteran. In 1970-1971, I was stationed in Chu Lai, Vietnam, as a medical company commander. Okay, today is Thursday, November 19th, 2009, and we are at Lake Michigan College in Benton Harbor, Michigan. Our interviewee, as just mentioned, is Dr. Gary Lulensky, and the uh, camera operator is Bill Langman. The interviewer is Richard Massa. We are performing this interview as part of the Veterans History Project being conducted by Grand Valley State University in Allendale, Michigan. Uh, Gary, in uh, what branch of the service did you participate? I was in the uh, United States uh, uh, Infantry. I uh, was uh, referred to as an obligatory volunteer because uh, in medical school, I, if I hadn't been willing to sign up for some active duty time, then the directors of the uh, programs for training called residencies, they would be uh, disinclined to look favorably upon you because then you might get drafted right out of the middle of a year where you were really uh, one of few and very much needed. So I signed up in 1966 uh, uh, to go into the very program after my part, part of my training was completed. And so then you, you finished your uh, medical training and then entered the service? Well, I finished medical school, a year of internship, and a year of surgical residency. Those were granted without much problem. If you really wanted to spend another three or four years becoming a fully trained surgeon, which I am, uh, then you would have to enter, enter a sort of lottery system, and about one out of 20 physicians who attempted to get that deferment, only a few received it. Now, was uh, part of your medical training schooling uh, covered by the GI Bill, or was that all external to that? That's a good question. After I returned from active duty, I had four more years of training. I didn't know it when I went in, but uh, I was eligible for some uh, portion of my, uh, my income came from the uh, GI Bill for educational purposes. So for those four years, uh, I did receive some additional payments. Now, when you entered the uh, service, where what did, did you receive your basic military training? Well, at that time, all the physicians, medical corps, the physicians were all in the medical corps. And then the uh, medical service corps, who were basically the executive officers, the right-hand people for the medical corps officers, and the veterinarians, and the nurses, we all went to Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, Texas. So I had a basic training course there uh, for six weeks. And after that, did you go uh, directly to uh, Vietnam after that? I think I went home for a few days. It was a little while ago, 40 years ago. I think I went home for a few days, but then I, uh, I went from Cleveland, Ohio to uh, Tacoma uh, Air Force Base and from uh, Tacoma to stop in Anchorage, uh, stop in Guam, and then on to uh, Benoit Airfield in Saigon. Now, were you uh, married or single at the time? I was married. I had one uh, small boy, Jeffrey, and uh, they stayed in Cleveland. And uh, do you remember arriving in country? Yeah, I do remember arriving in country. Even though it was so long ago, of course, we've had our course going on this. Helped revive memories and I hope more good than bad. Uh, but flying into Benoit, I was sitting with some other physicians and some enlisted men and some officers. And someone in the row next to me said, well, I hope this is better than the last time. Because, you know, the last time we, that I came over here, there were, there were rockets coming into the airport, so we had to get off the plane and go directly into bunkers. And I'm thinking, oh, <laughs> this, this can't be. I, I, can't, I can't be here and going to have to go down to some chute and go into a bunker. Well, we landed without problem, but uh, in 1968, during the Tet Offensive and afterwards, the Benoit Airport uh, took not only rocket attacks, but mortars and sappers and so that guy was really not making it up. He was telling the truth. 
Now, what rank were you when you arrived? I was uh, a captain when I arrived uh, because during the Vietnam War, you were giving, given cre credit for time in service for your medical training. In my case, that was four years of medical school and two years of postgraduate school. So I was given rank of captain because I was considered to have six years in service. My father was th in the same position as medical corps company commander as I was, but then the Second World War, they didn't give credit for your medical training. Now, uh, what was your position? Uh, were you a medical company commander or a surgeon who worked for the commander? No, I was a medical company co <coughs> commander. Uh, my MOS uh, directed me to be in charge of a company, 140 men, as opposed to a general medical officer who would be assigned to fire base. Uh, we had about 30 general medical officers and they were out in the middle of the jungle on a hilltop. So I was in a division rear area. We had a very secure perimeter. We were on the South China Sea and I was in charge of the company. And uh, how they expected me to know what to do with 140 people, some of them who were half crazy, how they expected me to do that in, in six weeks of learning, uh, I, I don't know. Not too important now. <coughs> so you said you were in a secure area, so your uh, medical facility did not come under direct fire? There were rocket attacks during the 1970-71 period, but uh, no, no significant mortar attacks, no significant attacks by units. Uh, we didn't have any significant explosions caused by SAP or so. We had two fixed hospitals. I assisted at surgery at each of those to some extent. And then I had a dispensary with two other physicians and I was in charge of uh, daily care for soldiers in the AmeriCal Division. And then we had an inpatient facility for those who'd been wounded and were gonna have what was called delayed primary closure. The soldier that was wounded with shrapnel did not go to the hospital and have those wounds closed up right away un unless they were life threatening. So one of my responsibilities was to decide when and how to uh, help those wounded. We also had a extensive inpatient rehabilitation unit with two full-time, fully trained psychiatrists. And they lived right next to me. So we had all kinds of people. We had sentries and motor pool people and uh, they had the division surgeon and his staff just uh, next on the next little hill. And we had all kinds of people. Could, could you describe what a typical day would be, if there was a typical day? <coughs> well, we had sick call every um, morning except Sunday. And one of the three doctors would, uh, would be assigned to morning sick call. One of the doctors would be available the rest of the day for any type of uh, urgent or emergency problems. One of the doctors would uh, make rounds in the hospital and in our hospital, not the big hospital, in our units where we had, uh, we had malaria victims too, in fact, quite a few. So one physician would, would be in charge of those patients and if there was some decision about doing surgery, then if it wasn't myself who had made the rounds and if it was one of the other two general medical officers, then they would uh, ask me whether I concurred or you know what we would do. So the afternoon was oftentimes was uh, surgery and then it, there was a physician on call in the evening and uh, we all stayed basically in the division rear. I, I had my own Jeep but July even in 1970 was not a place you wanted to go. So I never did take my Jeep out of the division area. I could have but I chose not to. So these cases then, were they more or less the more serious injuries that came to your facility? No, the more serious ones would go to the 312th Evacuation Hospital, which was big, big hospital. Every, every specialty of, of, of physician, or at least every specialty of surgical trained physician was available at the 312th Evac Hospital. And then the 27th Surgical Hospital, those were the places where not only military casualties, but oftentimes civilian casualties would be taken. My role was to help take care of those that didn't require 
immediate surgery, didn't have any abdominal wounds, didn't have any broken limbs. So mostly those were what we call soft tissue injuries. And uh, many of those soldiers were able to return to duty. And we, had, we didn't have anybody that was really getting sick or having something really bad happen because if that were to happen, we were supposed to transfer that patient to one of the two bigger facilities. Now, did you uh, have occasion to treat any of our service people who had been prisoners of war and had been uh, released? <coughs> no, I don't think we had any prisoners of war uh, assigned to, we certainly didn't have any assigned to my company, and I don't think in the division rear. Uh, there may have been some, the troops from the, out in the jungle, they, uh, they would come to us if, if they were advised to by the general medical officer or if, if they were close to our division rear area. Some of them may have been prisoners of war, but I, I don't recall sitting down and talking with anybody who said, you know, this is my second tour of duty and the first time I had to spend some time with the Viet Cong because they captured me. I don't remember any conversation like that. Uh, did the enemy avoid or go out of their way, attempt to target medical facilities? That's a difficult question. I, I know that the answer in, in 1968, 69 was yes. I think by the time I was there, the attitude of the enemy was to just sort of hold, hold in place. And so uh, we had the rockets come in, and, and one of the rockets actually did hit the Air Force clinic, which was the same as mine. Uh, it wasn't, though, intended specifically. That was just at the airfield, and unfortunately that rocket hit the building. It didn't destroy any planes, didn't impact the runway, but <clears throat> it sure did make a mess of the uh, clinic. Did your facility uh, treat enemy combatants? No, we did not. There were specific uh, rules and regulations for treating any combatants, and uh, they, they uh, had to be treated at a facility like the 312th, where they had military police and security personnel. <coughs> we didn't have any of our own military police. We had sentries, but not, not, a, uh, not a unit. Uh, during your time there, were you able to communicate regularly with uh, your family at all? Uh, we had a pretty good system called the Watts system, and uh, you'd have to walk over to this hill, which had all the telecommunication towers on it, and uh, then you would sort of take a number and sit in line. And most of the time, if you were patient, of course I would do that on a uh, day when I wasn't assigned to uh, sick call or wasn't assigned to a morning call. You, if you waited there, usually you could get through. When that rocket attack occurred, unfortunately, the way it was presented in the United States, including to my family, was that the Army outpatient facility had been struck by a, a rocket, and the physician and all 10 other people in the facility were dead. So my family thought that was me. And uh, I found out that that's the way it had been delivered. So that day I went to the Watts facility and uh, tried to do whatever I could do to, to get ahead, <laughs> beg and plead so I could let my uh, wife and my father and mother know that I was not in the facility that had been struck by the rocket. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I had to go and pronounce all those people uh, dead. That was one of the things that I had to do that was very unattractive. I do that every third day. Graves registration. Now, other than that, which was uh, obviously a memorable experience, uh, do you have any other uh, specific things that stand out with that success? Well, by the time I was uh, in Vietnam, we had terrible trouble with uh, drug abuse, and uh, that's why our rehab facility was full. That's why we had so many uh, enlisted uh, and even some officers being discharged 
um, what was called a 212 general discharge. Many of them had been involved with drug use and were considered unfit to remain on active duty. So I would have to go and do the physical exam that would precede their being dismissed. Uh, about everything happened. We had fraggings. We had, uh, we had some grenade thrown under the first sergeant's office. We had guys drive their trucks off the road. We had people shooting weapons in the, in the company, my company area. Uh, there were a lot of uh, strange and memorable things that happened, but I guess um, I look back upon it now mostly as, as the good part of it. Most of the time it was, it was comfortable and uh, peaceful and maybe even boring in the rear area. But when it was bad, when it was ter terrifying, it was still really terrifying like in 1968 everywhere. And did you have, uh, did you feel you had enough supplies and uh, food and facilities for both yourselves and your patients? Yes, I think that the uh, people involved in supply did a terrific job. Um, we always had, we had our own staff. We had uh, two full-time cooks and some assistants and they did good work. It was a little interesting. I found out later in the year when I went to Da Nang a couple times and when I went to Saigon to present this drug survey I had conducted, I, I saw all these people eating steak. And I'll tell you, we never saw a steak in, in my company during the year I was in the American Television. So I think there was some filtration going on there. But uh, we had excellent supply people and I, I think we as a group, we were very grateful to those people and uh, even even the maintenance people did a great job. You know, if we had a truck break down, it wouldn't take long and it'd be it'd be fixed. Now, what ways did you find to relieve the stress that built up from all all that you were experiencing? Well, when I got there, my medical service cooper officer told me that they had planned to build a, ba a basketball court. I thought, well, that's a good thing to do. And then a couple of days later, I saw these, you know, bags of cement coming in. A couple of days later, these guys in my company started putting up wooden frames and started making cement. Somewhere along the line, I asked my medical service co so I said, well, where did you get all that cement? Well, you understand he didn't really have a, an answer for that, but I, I kind of figured it out later on. I think maybe that's somewhere some of our stakes went. <laughs> but we did get the basketball court done. And then the Marine Air Group, uh, MAG-12, had been in Chulai. They had left before I got there. But the Marines, uh, they were dedicated to taking good care of themselves, including exercise. So they had a, a racquetball, uh, paddleball, squash, handball court made out of concrete, solid wood floors, brick walls, and I played a lot of handball. I played enough handball, my hands got kind of mm, pulverized. But I, I had a, uh, one of our medical service corps battalion executive officer, wonderful guy. He liked to play handball and he found out that I could be teachable. So we played a lot of handball. And uh, we had good facilities. Uh, I think probably the people out in our fire bases, I, I don't know what they did to break up um, the tension and, and do something you know, physical. We had lots of room. Fire bases were just uh, small little tops of hills and bunkers and wire and sentries. And I don't know what those troops did to uh, keep themselves fit, except of course they went out in the jungle. But we had, we had uh, good exercise facilities. We could swim in the ocean, too. We did that fairly frequently. It, it was safe by the time that I was there. I don't know if they would have done that in 1968. At the fire bases, the medical facilities there, can you describe those? <coughs> well, every fire base had a, a bunker-protected <laughs> clinic. And the, the way med medevac was done, at least through the time that I knew about what was going on, 
and that would be 1967. I had a good friend of mine who was in Vietnam as a combat commander, and I learned more from him. Uh, the fire bases all had bunkered, protected, underground facilities where they could uh, uh, provide some uh, even units of blood, uh, do some things to uh, triage or stabilize a wounded soldier. Because unless the, the, it was clear that the wounded soldier had to go immediately to one of the major hospitals, he was usually taken to the fire base because it was much closer and would be stabilized there and, and given plasma and, and given whatever was appropriate. And then a medevac helicopter would take those wounded soldiers to the division rear. Uh, some of the soldiers that were taken out of the jungle and out of combat, were they were not flown in by medevac helicopters. They were flown in by whatever helicopter pilot was bold and brave enough to go out and go there. Got to know some of those guys because I flew around doing the drug survey. <sighs> Different breed of people. <coughs> you did visit the, uh, some of the fire base medical facilities on occasion? And I visited all the fire bases, all 31 of them, because I did this drug survey. And I had a responsibility to go out there and support the doctors anyway. So I did a lot of flying in helicopters. But when I decided with two, uh, two enlisted men who had been out in the My Lai area, and we were talking about how bad the drug problem was, and they were saying, yeah, it really was. So we decided, well, let's find out how bad. So we began to do a questionnaire. These two guys were social workers, and they knew statistics. And I had uh, majored in psychology, so I knew statistics. So we put together a questionnaire, and we distributed it. And we had uh, up to 14,000 uh, soldiers in the AmeriCal Division. We had about 7,000 respond. And that was... Uh, that was good information, and because of that, I flew around a lot more. And what did your survey show? Um, <laughs> during the s um, winter of 1970 and the spring of 1971, about 30 to 35 percent of enlisted uh, personnel in the rear supply maintenance type areas admitted to more than just occasional. They admitted to frequent or habitual drug use of illegal drugs. Uh, the number of officers was less, but still pretty significant. About 10% of the questionnaires filled out by uh, troops that were in the field admitted to frequent use of one or more of the illegal drugs that were available. So. Uh, when that was done, and we had summarized the data, and I discussed it with the division surgeon, and he kind of was confused. And he said, well, all right. So then he looked it over. He said, okay, well, let's, let's go talk with the division general. So we did. And he kind of, hmm, I don't think he knew what to say, really. So a couple days later, he called me and the division surgeon back, and told the division surgeon, I want this Captain Walensky to present this material. I said, well, yes, sir. And he said, I mean, I want you to go on to MACV headquarters and present this material. So I did. And it was good that we were, were beginning to leave because the, it seemed like the drug problem was overwhelming. We even had LSD being sent from the states being used. We had two fragging episodes where uh, the, it was clear that two of our soldiers had been sent LSD and they were completely blown away. And they had thrown the these grenades. That made uh, some of their comrades nervous enough that they, they turned these guys into the CID. And then those two guys, they just, they disappeared. What drugs were most abused? Well, of course, the most used, uh, or you can say abused drug, was marijuana because it was so prevalent. Uh, but the problem in Vietnam is you weren't sure what was in it. Uh, it was opium and heroin, 
and barbiturates and methamphetamine and cocaine and uh, hallucinogens and of course the largest producer of opium in the world then and now is in the Golden Triangle up in be near the border of China, Laos and Cambodia. And when I was in Saigon, a CIA, a CIA officer presented the whole story on how the drug trafficking was done and protected by the Kuomintang army and sometimes flown into Saigon on Air America cargo planes. So that was a, a, pr a presentation I was not likely to forget. In fact, we're going to talk about that in one of our summit seminars in the spring about the drug problem, the drug trafficking, how it was done. And there's a great section from the movie American Gangster about exactly how it was done. It's very much what I was told by the CIA, CIA officer. And was there any uh, policy or procedure changes that came about because of your drug survey? I don't know that my drug survey had a real impact, but I think what was happening was that uh, there was an attempt to try to really rehabilitate, educate the, the soldiers who were involved with drugs. I think in the early part of the Vietnam War, they were just, if they weren't court-martialed or severely disciplined, or I don't know, worse than that maybe, uh, if, if they weren't punished severely, that would be unusual. I think that by the time I was there, it was more of an effort to uh, rehabilitate. I mean, they talk about the drug problem right now and mental Ill illness right now in, in, 19, in 2009, in November. Uh, and I think there's a lot of effort that's gone into helping our uh, troops who are presently returning from Iraq and Afghanistan. I could see some of that when I was in Vietnam. Some attempt to, well, we had psychiatrists. I mean, the psychiatrists weren't there to be punitive. They were there to be uh, mental value. We had a, a psychiatric social worker who was an enlisted man. He could sit down and try to help uh, one of these young 18 or 19 year old who uh, probably didn't know what he was doing. But the drugs were everywhere. Fire bases, we'd get them through the wire around our perimeter. Some of the people that cleaned our Quonset huts were called hooches. Some of those people you could buy drugs from. I found that out from some of my company people. And then when two of my medics that I worked with every day were, were caught by the CID because they were heroin addicts, then I didn't think I was so smart. Not the reason for the drug use there? Was it a, a boredom, a fear? Well, you hit it right. You stuff. hit it right on the head. Boredom was a big cause, because there's nothing to do, and then fear, a uh, way to get around it, put it away, was uh, on the other reason that that drugs were used. So you 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 did that just right. Um, so back to your back to your time on the base there. Uh, did you have a chance to? entertainment provided or did you get to go off base for entertainment at any time other than your swim in the ocean? <laughs> no, the you know, USO and all the people involved with it did a great job. We had an officer's club and an enlisted man's club. We would routinely have uh, quality entertainment. There were some groups that came from the states or from other English-speaking countries, Australia, and then we had some groups that were from the Southeast Asia area, but we had lots of entertainment. And most of the time, uh, you know, it was, it was well done and the troops enjoyed it and we had movies regularly. Uh, once in a while, things got out of hand and then we might have some kind of uh, scuffle going on. Then the doctor who was on call <laughs> might get called over to the outpatient clinic because now you had to sew up somebody who got punched in the face. But in general, the, the, there was a, a lot of entertainment in the division rear. I, I don't know what the, the guys out of the fire base, I don't know what they did. 
I don't think there was uh, any room to have much entertainment at a fire base. Did you have an opportunity to go on leave for any period of time? I got to go on one week on R&R, &R, and I went to Hawaii, met my wife. And uh, then they had had an, a new policy that kind of came in effect about 1970, I think, when things started to be going down in activity and ferociousness. And I was allowed to return to the United States for one week. So I had two weeks out of 52 where I was not in my Quonset hut in July. Back to your uh, time on the at the facility there, uh, were you awarded any medals or citations? I was awarded a uh, bronze star, but not for any particular act of bravery. And uh, we all received service medals, and I, I can't remember. Um, I, I flew a lot, but I did not fly enough to have any award for that time. Uh, combat medics who flew a certain amount of time, received a, a, an air medal besides their combat med medic award, and they deserved it. So I didn't receive anything special, but that was, uh, that was all right. I, my friend Stanley was awarded the Silver Star for a heroism that beyond belief, and uh, that happened in 1967, and he was awarded the Silver Star by the Secretary of Defense and in his interview, he has a picture of that. That's pretty impressive. Can you describe what that occasion was, what he had done during that? <coughs> well, my, my uh, friend Stan McLaughlin was company commander with the 199th Light Infantry Brigade, and he was in the worst time at the worst area. He was in Vietnam between June of 1967 and January when he was wounded when he stepped on a mine. Uh, he was in the jungle and the Viet Cong and NBA were everywhere. <laughs> so on one occasion he and his company went out and recovered a captured long-range reconnaissance platoon. And that was no easy, that was no easy accomplishment because uh, they were out in the jungle, we didn't have Air Force support, almost impossible to bring helicopter support in. And they rescued that, that group and he received uh, the Bronze Star for that, and then they had another episode where they uh, attacked a large bunker complex that had just been put up. It was probably a regimental battalion headquarters for an NVA or BC regiment, and he led his troops into there, and they basically wiped it out, and, and he exposed himself as the company commander, and he received uh, appropriate award. So he received a bronze star with B, and he received a silver star for those two days in December. Uh, do you recall any uh, particularly humorous or unusual events <laughs> to the lighter side? <coughs> well, again, you name it, and, and we, we, I mean, we had it happen. Um, uh, there are all kinds of things that, uh, that happened that were uh, unexpected, uh, humorous, or almost like crazy. I think the one I remember the, the best was because I had just gotten there. We had a uh, officer's party. There were a lot of parties. We had parties in the company, which would actually include the officers and the men, as long as I said that, you know, it was okay to do things together, and I thought it was. But then again, I was the doctor. <laughs> but we had uh, lots of parties, and one of the first ones I was taken to by my administrative service officer was at the MAG-13, their outdoor patio cookout area. I mean, first class. And there were officers there. I didn't know anybody except my uh, administrative service officer, who was a first, first lieutenant. And there were a group of guys that were hanging out together. And I found out in just a little while that these were all warrant officers. Uh, warrant officers were helicopter pilots, among other things. And they were only 18, 19 years old. So they wouldn't usually be involved with officers' parties. But they were officers. And 
I want to tell you, I thought I'd seen a lot of crazy things in my college years, but I never saw anything like that. I mean, I don't know how these guys could have possibly recovered and flew their helicopters the next day. But I recovered. It was, it was humorous, and it was crazy. And as I look back upon it, it was, it was kind of like a statement on, man, this place is really weird. This is <laughs> really not the world, which is what everybody said. Do you have any photograph of those parties? No, I wasn't <laughs> prepared, so I didn't take my camera. <laughs> I, I did have some pictures that, um, that and I s ended up saving them, and I, did, I do have some pictures that are interesting of some of the officers and uh, one of one of our fire bases. I showed that picture when I presented uh, about the Tet Offensive in uh, one of our classes. Picture of the fire base, and then in the spring, that fire base was completely overrun. So I had some interesting pictures, but if I'd known that that party was going to end up like it was, I, yeah, I would have tried to take a camera, but uh, I, was, I was not expecting that. Nobody got hurt, so it was still humorous and crazy, but it, it was not, like, dangerous. Do you recall any pranks that were played that were either just oh, for fun or? All the time, all the time, every day, every day. And they would play pranks even on people like the psychiatrists other officers in like the medical battalion would uh, play tricks on the psychiatrists. Uh, that, was, uh, that was a big time activity in the rear. Thinking up of ridiculous uh, pranks. Do mm -hmm. you have any examples that come to mind? Well, being the company commander, I didn't get too much involved in doing pranks. Uh, I, I guess I would have gotten more involved than maybe if I was my medical service corps officer or one of the other, the, the sergeants. And of course, a lot of these uh, pranks and, and crazy behavior uh, were between a group of uh, the officers and the enlisted men, but also between the what was called the druggies and the other people. In many cases, they were, they were way into alcohol too much. So there was a lot of pranks and silly things done. Uh, I didn't. I didn't get too much involved in it, and I don't. I don't remember any prank that was pulled on me that made me feel like a, an idiot. But it might have happened. Uh, what did you think about your fellow officers, uh, soldiers, staff, uh, as far as their preparedness and competence? Well, you know, there's there were two kinds of officers. Uh, in my division. There was the obligatory volunteer or the, the enlisted um, officer who went to OCS or he was drafted as an enlisted man and, and wanted and was allowed to go to OCS or of course anybody graduated from one of the military academies. Uh, the people in the higher ranks, most of those were career officers and there were big differences, big differences between the career officer and the part-time limited action officer. I, I had to deal with five or six division surgeons, all of whom were career medical officers. And their attitude was, uh, it was quite a bit different than myself and the other doctors that I worked with because we, uh, we knew we were only gonna be in the military for two years, but that was all all right. One of the things that was really disturbing to me and a lot of people and my friend Stan was, you know, when someone got to be down to 100 days left in their commitment, you know, their interests would obviously start going down. They'd start marking off the calendar. It became uh, two-digit midgets once you had 99 days. And you look at the enemy, there's nobody counting off days who was in the enemy's group. Their commitment was as long as it took. So. Uh, there was a real contrast between officers and officers and between viewing the time in Vietnam on our side and the time in Vietnam on the other side. So the different, the distinction between the career officer and the non-career officer was? Well, the career officer was looking at it 
career, things that would benefit his career. Why did he go to Vietnam? Well, I knew the division surgeons pretty well. I got to know one of them pretty well. Mo mostly they went because that was the way they could get advanced in rank, spin a tour in combat. Well, I wasn't going to get advanced in rank by a tour in combat, nor was any other doctor who was going to be in the military for two years. It was totally inappropriate. There were a lot of differences like that. A career military officer is looking at his career. What, what, would I, what else would you expect him to do? Were they more of an administrative uh, type people rather than hands-on medical people? Would well, the division surgeons as a group, especially one who was in my same field of ear, nose, and throat surgery, uh, he was a very accomplished and dedicated surgeon. And he actually was in charge of the residency training program at Fitzsimmons Hospital for many years. I actually talked with him several years after I got back. Uh, we had an OBGYN division surgeon, obstetrics gynecology. Well, I don't think he did very much. So, yeah, there was a lot of administration for the division surgeon, the medical Italian officers, who are the, well, those are the people I knew. I don't, don't know about operations officers or security or intelligence officers, but I think um, a, a lot of the medical officers who were career, um, they, were, they were involved in patient care. They were at the hospitals. Uh, this ear, nose, and throat surgeon, Dr. Kokorian, man, he handled some of the worst cases. I mean, if they had some terrible neck wound, they had fully trained ear, nose, and throat surgeons at both hospitals. But he was probably the best, most experienced head and neck surgeon. And so he would get called in for often the worst of the civilian and uh, our own American troop casualties. Do you think at the time to keep a diary of your experiences, or at the time was it something you didn't think you'd ever want to remember? I wish I had now, because my attitude about everything has changed a lot. For a lot of years, I was just very resentful, and actually, uh, it took many years until my friend Stan and I began, began to feel the need to share, get rid of some of these bad feelings. I had a lot more bad feelings than he did. Um, but th there, there, was, there was a lot of animosity while I was there. Animosity between career officers and non-career officers. Animosity between the, the uh, drinking sergeants and the druggy enlisted men. And uh, you, you, we, we, had, we had racial problems too, no question about it. Anyone that wants to say that was not true is just trying to fool you or dazed and confused. We had lots of racial problems. So it was a lot of resentment. And I, I, if I had it to do over again where I am now, I wish would have liked to kept the diary because I would have been able to remember a lot more. But you know, since, since my attitude has changed, and it's also true for my lifelong friend Stan, we have remembered things we've just talked. I was just with him. We've remembered things that we had never remembered. I don't mean just a few things. I mean a lot of things. A lot of things I've answered to you, and you had very good questions, are things that if you'd asked me 10 years ago, I probably would have said, I probably would have just sat here and said nothing. So th th I think there's a lot of goodness that comes out of the, the, the history project, things we're doing now, today, the class that we're holding here in Southwest Michigan. And I even think it's changed the attitude of the American people. If you were here for our weekend last year, and if you could come for our veterans, Vietnam Veterans Weekend this coming June, where we're going to have the 80 percent replica of the Vietnam War Memorial, there's been a huge change. People want to know. Th they want to hear what the veterans have to say. They want to know how they're feeling, what their feelings are. And they don't, they don't s necessarily think the Vietnam War was a good idea. But there's no reason to blame our soldiers, especially not the ones who either enlisted, were drafted, or were obligatory volunteers. Um, did you have a chance to interact with the native Vietnamese while you were there? 
Yes, uh, I was in charge of a medical assistance program where we went to help the Vietnamese every other Saturday uh, in a village that was on an island in the river that was near Chu Lai. I don't know the name of the river. Maybe I did it one time. But we interacted with them a lot because we would go every other Saturday morning and we actually, I had the authority and did on some occasions if there was really a sick child or an adult with bad infection, I had the authority to have that person taken by, we had a medevac helicopter, not, not one that stayed there. You never would have a helicopter stay in a place like that. They'd come and drop us off, but we had the authority, we had two radio operators, we had the authority to call in a medical helicopter if I decided that we were gonna send this child to the hospital. But we had interacted pretty well there. It was not like the civil action programs which we've learned about in our course. Those people, uh, like uh, the leader of our group, Don Alsbro, they interacted with the people all the time. The friend Stan McLaughlin helped the people relocate in a fortified hamlet. He, act, he interacted with the people all the time. And I, I appreciated getting to know something about the Vietnamese and their history. I never learned much of the language. But there were always problems trying to interact with the people. And one Saturday when our helicopter let us off and flew away and we walked around the building where we always had had the medical assistance program, uh, the back of the building was where we landed and that was still there, but the front of the building was gone. And there were no people there. There were some graves there from the, the home security forces and the Viet Cong were proving that you may, you may think that this is secure and you can have your children taken care of by these Americans, but you're wrong. So we didn't do any more medical assistance programs. And how did the Vietnamese uh, treat you or uh, respond to you as in, other than in the formal setting where you're trying to help them or treat them just in day-to-day -day interaction? Well, the day-to-day -day interaction was limited to the uh, Vietnamese that were either working or doing something that involved our military. So we had uh, people that would come in and, and actually clean the clothes. And they're called hooch mates. There wasn't much interaction there because it was like servants. You know, it was like we didn't have much opportunity to get to know people. Now, I know a lot more about how many of our soldiers did get to know people. But see, I didn't have that opportunity. After all, I told you, never went beyond the fence. So I never really was going to have the time to spend to sit down and try to understand. But I'm glad that we had those civil action pro uh, programs. And now a group of our people just went back. And the, the Vietnamese are at least apparently very ha glad that we were there and very friendly. And uh, the animosity, which you might think would be overwhelming, the difference in political philosophy that's still there. Uh, the group that went from our, let's, uh, lest we forget group, they, they're going to present their experience, but I already know it was terrific. Now, when you became a uh, two-digit midget, did your uh, behavior change at all? Not much, not much, but um, I'll give you an example that I remember now. I don't know why I remember it now. There was a, a lot of bad things that physicians had to do, and the orthopedic physicians at the hospitals had still had to do a lot of amputations. It wasn't like the Civil War, but it's still bad. And I found out from various physicians that th there was a syndrome among orthopedic surgeons, a pattern of behavior. When they get down to a certain limited few days left, they wouldn't want to do any more amputations. They would try to get one of the other surgeons to do it. And that was not just an isolated. It was like, I don't want to do this anymore. This is not why I became a physician. I don't want to spend time doing amputations. So there's a good example of what happens when you get down near the end among medical personnel. Was there any different uh, precautions or anything you took now that it was uh, getting time to leave for your own safety? No. <laughs> I, uh, I, I didn't, I didn't go into the village, and uh, I, I didn't uh, ever come 
close to being hit by a rocket, but we all kind of just sort of hit out, you know? We hit out. We uh, kind of stayed in our own area. Um, we didn't have a desire, well, of course I went to the fire bases, but we didn't have a desire to go out there because uh, it was pretty safe where we were. Do you recall the day you left? Uh, <coughs> I'm a little hesitant to tell you what happened when I left because uh, up to this point I don't think anybody was there. It's unbalanced. But uh, leaving Vietnam was an incredible horror show. Incredible, hor horrific time for me. Maybe I'll sum it up in two minutes and then we can finish our interview. Uh, I was supposed to go from Chulai to Da Nang and Da Nang to Cameron Bay. Everyone left from Cameron Bay. But I had to have my 201 file. Oh, clever doctor that I was. I found out the sooner you sign into Cameron Bay, the sooner you leave the country. You don't have to wait till your D roast date. You can leave early. Boy, that was exciting. So exciting, I hardly didn't, didn't even want to tell anybody else. So I got all ready to go, and I go over to get my uh, 201 file. It's not there. Not there? I've been there for 362 days. How could it not be there? No, that's how I remember all very well. Don't know. Well, find out. Okay, they found out. Well, it's in Da Nang. It's a company, uh, a company in Da Nang. Well, I'd never been in a company in Da Nang. So then I had the privilege to go to the adjutant general's office. Boy, whoever, whoever saw me, unfortunately it wasn't Don, because he was in the adjutant general's office in the same division, but it wasn't him. Some officer had to put up with me demanding why my 201 file had been misplaced. So finally, the adjutant general of the division I demanded as the medical company commander to talk to the adjutant general and I made not, I'm not the stink that I got to. He was not happy with me either, but he, he had a helicopter go get my 201 file, brought it back, got in the plane, went to Da Nang, plane was overbooked, kicked us off the plane, sat in the tarmac for about eight hours until that plane went down to Cameron Bay, came back, then we got in the plane in the dark, went down to Cameron Bay. Now the time signing in early is pretty much gone away, but that was nothing compared to the next couple days. Um, I, I, uh, my wallet fell out of my uh, pants, and I had no, no ID card for about six hours. Total panic. I uh, went in the same door to check my, my duffel bag and was supposed to hand my manifest in and go out the other door. But instead, I went back out the same door I went in. So now I didn't have a seat on the plane. And I went to the officer's club and uh, sitting there. My wallet was returned by a warrant officer, by the way. So those guys are okay with me. <coughs> I'm sitting there, and this guy comes in and says, is there a Captain Lulensky here? As Soon as he said that, I looked at my briefcase. I thought, oh, no, you didn't hand your manifest in. He comes over. I said, I know why you're here. He said, Captain, you, did not have your, you, do, you do not have a seat on the plane. He said, well, you know, I remember saying something like, well, cut, just do something. I mean, like, get, let, get, get me on the next plane. Well, before that happened, uh, that, e that night, we were all in the officer's barracks. And just to prove a point, uh, some sapper or group of sappers came in, and they blew up one of those huge oil depots, storage depots, like we had here on the island, on the St. Joe River, gigantic things. Blew it up. Blew some of the officers in the building I was in out of their bunks. Now, the Cameron Bay Airport is closed. It's on red alert. Nobody's going to get a new manifest. Nobody's going to get on a plane. No planes are going to leave. No planes are going to come in. That went on for two days. Everything was totally shut down. And the explosion was, I, I can't. I can't describe it to you. I mean, it was like an atomic bomb. And it was close, it was right at the end of the runway. So finally, I did get 
some sergeant to go and take me and I got a new manifest. Now I'm kind of like past my date I was supposed to leave. I mean, I've been there forever now. But I'm going to get on the plane. And I go to the get up on the stairs, and this is the last thing I finish with. And there's a, there's a, do a drug smelling dog there with a, a, some type of MP. And he sees I'm a captain in the medical corps. And it's right here. He said, Captain, you, do you have any type of drugs or illegal weapons? I said, I only have a prescription for sleep medicine from one of my fellow medical officers. He looked at it. It was a prescription. It was my name. It was some benign sleep medicine. So you can put that in my hat, and you can get on the plane. And I looked at him, and I looked at the dog, I looked at the plane. I got on the plane. That's my last moment in Vietnam. Certainly a memorable one. Uh, because of your delays, your family was probably waiting for you to arrive. Were you able to contact them? No, and the base is on red alert. You don't contact anybody. And once you're in the plane, you don't contact anybody. I contacted them when I got to uh, Tacoma, Washington. Tra Travis Air Force Base, that's where it was. Travis. Now, you've mentioned at least one uh, friendship that you've maintained after your service. Uh, are there others as well? Did you have a number of people you keep in touch with? No, and again, that's because of the nature of being there. But um, my friend Stan and I went to, to uh, high school together. And I just visited, just had dinner with he and his wife and my wife uh, about three days ago. And we were very close before and stayed that way. I've never gone to a reunion of the Americal Division, so I've never had the chance to see if any of the other medical officers were interested. Maintain contact with two medical officers that served with me for a while, but. Hmm, I guess I should call Dick Gross up. I think I should. But now, you know, I'm thinking about going back to a reunion of the Americal because there were good people there. And uh, the people, but we have some people here that were in the Americal, and they're good people. Now, did your uh, medical experience in the service uh, help guide you to your current uh, specialty? I had to make a decision on what specialty to go to before I went into the military. But my experience there solidified my dedication to being a surgeon. Well, my father was a surgeon too. Uh, he was a surgeon with the 82nd Airborne. He was fully trained. So I was kind of going down that path anyway. But I think it, it strengthened my personal desire to be a surgeon. Um, I was very impressed with the dedication of the medical officers, and I was overwhelmingly awed by the heroism and the dedication of the um, corpsman, the medical corpsman, the combat medic. Uh, I guess it certainly has uh, changed my view, you know, of nurses and people I work with that are in medicine, and changed my attitude when I was in my training because of the way those people. Uh, acted and, and how long they worked. And when we had that um, fire base, Marianne, overrun, there were 140 casualties. About half were killed and the other half were wounded. And I went over and helped out for a while because they needed every surgeon that they could find to help, plus all the ones that were in charge of the different specialties, even eye surgery. And uh, those people, like my father, they just kept on, they just kept on. 24 hours. I know that they did. My father operated for 70 hours behind German lines on D-Day, D-Day plus one. So uh, I guess the military brings out the best in a lot of people. Certainly some of the doctors I know it did. Now, could you describe your arrival back in the States? And did you have any kind of a re-indoctrination to normalcy program? Mm, no, coming back to the United States was just get out of your uniform as fast as you could and hope that you weren't going to be uh, attacked by some group because you were a uh, hateful baby color. Did you experience any of that? Well, you bet. Yep. And 
it was, I think, pretty much the same. There was not anybody going to say, welcome home, you did a great job. Stand when he got to, the, to his assignment of the place. He figured, like, you know, if someone would say something. I mean, here's a guy with Vietnamese decorations for doing the work in the Hamlet and the Silver Star, Bronze Star with V, Bronze Star. This is a military hero. And uh, no, one, no one said anything. He said, you know, you're going to go to your next assignment is such and such. And that, that's kind of the way it was for me. They said, you're, you'll be going to Fort Carson, Colorado. Okay. So it's not too surprising that when I left the service, I didn't continue in, in the reserves. But it was uh, the American public that turned so much, so much against it by 1971. You could just feel the coldness and the Oh, it's actually was worse than coldness. It was actually absolutely hate. Didn't want to be in the war. Do you see any similarities between that and what we're seeing today? Yeah, we don't have time for that hour, but <clears throat> I sure do. I sure do. The nature of the warfare, the most recent thing is the taking away of many free fire zones, which is exactly the way it was when I was there see the enemy, but you can't shoot at the enemy. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about? Uh, no, it's been excellent, and I want to congratulate you on doing an excellent job. If you develop those questions yourself, you are a special person. Thank you very much. And thank you for your service.